Hi, Melissa. Hi, good morning. How are you? I am doing a lot better. <laughs> However, as I just mentioned, you may or may not have heard, I've just been through the initiation of COVID. Um, and I found your video on Telegram and had watched it recently. Um, and so I thought it just would be a really great opportunity for us to talk about German new medicine and this perspective on the body and healing and and then we can talk about it in context to my current illness and, and a variety of questions I have um, as a result. Cool. Yeah. I mean, where you have symptoms, it's the perfect time to dive in and to look beyond the normal narrative. The normal narrative says, oh, you came into contact with someone who had a germ and the germ got on you and then the germ made you sick. Um, but that is not the full story. That is a zoomed in very partial, uh, incomplete story of how people develop the symptoms we call sickness. And I guess just to zoom out and to talk about this from the biggest perspective is, you know, what is this? What is German new medicine or Germanic healing knowledge? It is the discovery of natural law by a man who experienced a tragedy. He lost his son um, in a tragic accident, and uh, then he developed testicular cancer. And he started to see that there's a pattern between something traumatic in someone's life and a disease process, a cancer. And he went on to see that it's not just cancer. It's not just, you know, something as shocking as losing your child and developing cancer. It's something as annoying as not being able to find a parking spot in the grocery store and being like, I'm frustrated, I'm annoyed and sneezing. That happened to me yesterday. <laughs> um, and it's it's things when we have, things that we experience in our life and we are caught off, off guard. We are surprised by it. We weren't ready for it. The body adapts and it ad adapts either in, you know, big long-term adaptations or micro adaptations, you know, so we can look further into, you know, what you experienced that caused, so what symptoms did you have specifically? Um, yeah. So, and I feel like after watching your video, I know what caused it. Um, it definitely is related to upgrade. Um, so the symptoms were headache, fever, um, difficulty breathing, uh, just sort of all the sort of normal symptoms that have been going along with any sort of fever or cold. Um, and then, but I could tell it was COVID right away because I also had this very spiky sensation. Like when I would cough, I could feel little spikies in my system, which is something I've never really felt before. Um, so those were those were the initial symptoms. Mm, yeah. So any kind of coughing, we want to look at territory here. Cough and a fever. Was there any? Were you coughing anything up, or was it a dry cough? Um, it was a dry cough initially, but you can probably hear I have plenty of uh, mucus and phlegm. Gotcha. Okay. So we've got a territorial fear conflict. This is some type of threat in the territory, feeling unsafe, which causes adaptation in the bronchial mucosa, along with, you know, a stink conflict of, oh, this stinks. I'm annoyed. I'm frustrated. I couldn't sniff out the danger because sometimes we'll, you know, start having a cough and then say, oh, no, I have, I, I got COVID. I got the, the sickness. And then we are annoyed. We're, we are suspicious. We couldn't sniff out the danger. And so when we're looking at these adaptations, we look at what was the thing that caught us off guard, what shocked us, and then the body adapts. The bronchial mucosa will widen so you can get more oxygen into your lung. The sinus cavity will widen so that we can detect more scent. We can bring in more. And every adaptation that the body goes through is for survival. You know, so we have to think not not that we were actually in threat, not being able to find a parking spot or something annoying that happened. It's not, you know, it's how we're perceiving it. Our biology is ancient and perceives everything in our modern world through a very, very, very ancient lens. And so we have to keep that in mind as we're going about our lives. And we're like, oh, that, you know, it wasn't that big of a deal. But to your body, it's life or death. To your body, with, you know, when you can't swallow something, it is of utmost importance that your body helps you to either swallow that thing or to spit it out. Because to be, you know, to be uncertain about whether I can swallow something is to be potentially my, my existence to be threatened. And so when we're looking at these five biological laws, we're looking at how 
is my body perceiving? How am I perceiving this environment? And what does my body need to do to adapt to allow me to survive? I mean, and that's what my body did. It adapted. It survived. It's um, definitely on the mend. It's so fascinating, uh, you know, because I also really allowed the fever to take its course initially, because I think so frequently when we have symptoms, the immediate reaction in our society is like, hey, let's go find something to tamp down those symptoms instead of allowing them to run their course. Because, you know, as you're saying, the body is really ancient in how it functions and how it heals from illness. And there's a purpose to, which is why I allowed as painful as it was or as uncomfortable as it was myself to fever, um, especially for the first several nights. And then, you know, it, it would become intolerable and I would and take a medicament to uh, to alleviate that. But for the most part, I really wanted to allow my body to go through that process because I understand it's doing its job. It's doing a really great job, whether or not that feels completely comfortable in the moment. Exactly. And that's the thing is symptoms are not comfortable. They are repair. Like our body is restoring tissue. It's a construction site. And so you know, that's going to come along with swelling and swelling is painful and there's swelling in the head, which creates the headache. And so all of this is, but it's when we realize that there is tissue loss and then tissue restoration. When we're in the conflict, either the body is building up extra tissue or it's eroding tissue. It sounds like in the conflict you experienced, there was loss of tissue in the lungs, loss of tissue in the sinuses, during the conflict, again, to bring in more oxygen so that you could bring in more information and then once you're back to safety, oh, now that it's over, the body now has to rebuild and restore that mucosal lining, the, the mucosal lining of the, the lungs. And so what that means is I'm coughing and I am feverish and my body is, you know, in this state of tissue res restoration and I'm not um, feeling my normal self. I need to rest now because for every, so when you're in the conflict, that's um, elevated fight or flight. Your body was using up more resources. So now that you are in the that rest phase, that healing phase, you're tired. You're like, it's the middle of the day, but I just want to be in bed. And that makes perfect sense because now you have the safety that you need in order for your body to go through that repair phase. And so, yes, you know, in the modern world, we're too busy. We want to suppress the symptom. Let me get rid of this as soon as possible. I don't have time for this. But that's the thing is our body works in rhythms. Our body works in harmony. And when we interrupt that rhythm with conflict, you have to know that there's going to be a swing back. And so living, you know, in that natural state where you are in harmony with your body, you're allowing natural biological processes to take place without hampering them, you know, but that does take a lot of trust. And when people don't trust their body, when they don't trust that bacteria and what we call viruses, that they have a purpose, that there's a job that they're doing, and it's all in helping you to get back to homeostasis and get back to balance. Um, but when you see things as an external enemy, this bad thing got inside of my body, it's causing bad things to happen. That's a completely different mentality. Of course, you're going to take something to try to, you know, um, eliminate the symptom or to prevent yourself from, um, from getting it in the first place. But when you understand the fourth biological law that Dr. Hammer discovered is that bacteria and viruses and fungus in the body are helpers. They're there to support the body during the healing phase and they only become active when they're necessary. Well, so, but then I live with somebody who is not on the new German medicine tip, who's very much in, you know, germ warfare um, and things like that. And so how then, because there's a part of me that's like, I'm just, this, it's only about me. This is about a situation I've been through. I understand where this came from. You might think, oh, well, she was on a plane. <laughs> she didn't do X, Y, or Z. And this is why uh, my wife is sick. But I, I live with this person whom I love very much, and they have this very different perspective. And so how then to balance, how to communicate this information to someone who <laughs> is deathly afraid that now I'm going to be transmitting something to them that's going to cause them to be ill. And here's the thing, their fear just might make it come true, in which case it only validates their perception. And so it's this really challenging sort of tightrope walk in terms of helping people to understand, you know, that, you know, I've, I just, I've not been a germ 
like a germ warfare person for a really long time because I'm all about microbes are magic. And um, there's a lot of beauty to the microbial world and finding balance there. And um, for as many, quote unquote, scary bad guys, we think there are, there's way more good guys such that even if you were to imagine that this one thing happened to uh, attack you, that you, you just you have so much more on your side. There's so much more on your defense mechanism and your team. But how to sort of how to help people who maybe have no understanding of this German new medicine to to feel more at ease? I mean, is there even anything we can do other than present the concepts and hope that they they read into them? Yeah, it's a very personal journey because if, if a person's mind is so, you know, fixated on the fear, the fear often will trump other information, you know, the, the fear and just the ideology that we've been fed since we were children. I mean, they've been this whole agenda, this whole thing has been going on for a very long time. I mean, ever since the, you know, Louis Pasteur and the germ theory became a thing, you know, this whole narrative that there's scary bugs and germs and that we need to outwit nature with a with an injection, with some type of potion in order to prevent you from getting the thing. It doesn't work. Clearly, we've been doing this for, you know, 200 some years now, and people are sicker than ever before. They're, people aren't healthier um, knowing about the, the, you know, alleged viruses and this whole microbial world. Obviously, we've got some part of the story completely wrong, but it's going to take a person actually investigating that and putting the dots together because when they're driven by fear, like you said, they see, oh, you have symptoms. They have a fear all of a sudden. Oh, no. I'm going to get it. That's their territorial fear. And they can manifest those symptoms because their body is adapting not to a microscopic particle, but to their experience of what they see going on in you. And things are even way more subtle than that because even before you exhibit any symptoms, because sometimes people say, well, I didn't have any symptoms, but I was carrying it and I transferred it. We have to look into energy. We have to look into what am I picking up off of you? What am I feeding off of you? Because there's so much more than simply meets the eye. There are energetic exchanges. There are, you know, there's a dominant vibe, vibration, someone who's emitting a vibration and someone who's receiving it. And so most people, they're, you know, they're hypnotized. They're hypnotized because of the TV, because of the things that we watch all day. And so they're in a hypnotic trance. And so they're very susceptible to, you know, you, and what you've got going on and maybe some fears that you have or things that are going on in your experience and they pick it up and they don't even realize they picked anything up. They think they got a germ. They think that you breathed in their vicinity and that, you know, this magic thing came through your <laughs> breath on them. And that is, it's, it's food. Yeah. It is. Yeah, it is. It's a hypnotic spell. And so that question of how do we help someone, we have to present it and hope that they wake up to it because you can't force this on anyone. They have to see it. They have to see it for themselves, but they, you know, they have to ask questions. So question asking is a really, really good way to. So for example, what about a person who doesn't get it? Let's say there's a, you know, a gathering of people and, you know, half of them develop the symptoms, but the other half don't. Why didn't the other half get sick? And we have, you know, and so you have to actually ask those questions and the person has to go through the process of answering that question in order to look at the holes in their theory. But people are very reluctant to do that because it's, you know, they feel so certain because it's on the TV, because it's what people talk about. It's what they, the expert. And so people subjugate themselves to authority figures and they say, well, I don't need to understand all the details. Little old me, I'm not a scientist. I trust the experts. And so they view themselves in this, you know, inferior position and they, they write off all their thinking. I don't have to think because I'm not an expert. And so we, they leave their thinking to the experts and they don't ever ask their own questions. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, so then this goes to the next thing. So does this mean that we just allow the process to take place and don't support it at all? which I don't think is the answer, but right, like that's the extreme, like, oh, well, if it's just this territorial fear, then once you're over the fear, you don't actually need vitamin C or any of these other nutrients that are going to support the body potentially through this um, healing crisis that's going on. So I'd be curious to hear what are sort of, what's the new German medicine thought process there? Is it solely a mental, emotional exercise or is there 
herbs and other things that help support this process? Or, or is that still sort of a, a developing area? It really depends on the individual. Like myself, I'm very much um, a minimalist when it comes to interventions. Um, and so I just let my body do its thing. If I've got symptoms, I've processed through those symptoms. I know if I was in conflict for three days, I'll have symptoms for about three days. If I was in conflict for a week, I'll have symptoms for about a week. And so I just know that I'll do soothing things, herbs, teas, whatever, if it feels good, if it's supportive for my system. Something though, for example, um, like the example of vitamin C. Vitamin C is a sympathetic stimulant. And so it can seem like it is kicking out my symptoms, but what it's actually doing is shifting my body out of the healing phase, out of that restoration phase, and it works as a stimulant of the sympathetic system. And so it seems as though it has eradicated my symptoms, but really it's just kind of switched my gear out of healing back into conflict. And for example, even something like coffee or caffeine can mitigate symptoms. And so if you're having like a really... Um, intense headache and swelling and you're just super duper uncomfortable, have a sip of black tea, have a sip of coffee, have some vitamin C. That's going to bring down the swelling a bit to make you more comfortable. And so if a person needs that comfort, if they need that measure, then go for it. You know, I I am a big fan of a person just doing what makes sense to them and doing it. So when you understand the biological laws, uh, you're able to operate within them in a way that makes biological sense. And so even if, so if Taking that sip of coffee or that sip of tea is going to elongate your healing phase because it's, you know, instead of letting your body go just directly through it, you're like, oh, well, I'd rather be a little more comfortable for a longer period of time than a little less comfortable for a shorter period of time. Um, and so that's that's simply how it works. So uh, so then is there so let's back up then. Let's uh, what are the laws of new determined medicine? How does one operate within them? Yes, absolutely. So the first biological law is the psyche brain organ connection. And so this is the, the, our body. Here we are just going throughout our life. The psyche is our entire like innate intelligence. It's picking up on the changes in temperature, the sounds uh, going on. Everything in our environment is being picked up by our psyche. And so when something shocking happens, and so this is a moment in time where you are unprepared. I wasn't prepared for this. I, you know, I was caught off guard. Um, it was kind of sudden and um, overwhelming. So it was a dramatic event that caught me off guard. I, in that moment, wasn't prepared for it. So my body adapted. My body turns on a biological program. So there's hundreds of different biological programs that the body can turn on. And it, your body will determine which one gets turned on based on its perception of your experience of whatever it was. And so it's not the conscious mind. It's not that, oh, I... I think I had this problem. It's an immediate. So before you even have words to describe what happened, it's like a lightning bolt. The program gets turned on. The body starts adapting. And, you know, you might resolve it very soon thereafter. You might resolve it after a few seconds. It might be, oh, gosh, that was, you know, really shocking. Um, but I'm over it. And, and then the body starts healing. So in that moment, the psyche perceives it. There's an impact in the brain. So this is one of the really, really cool things that Dr. Hammer discovered is that you can do a CT brain scan and there are these circular formations in the brain. And it's, a, it's an impact of energy to that brain region that occurs when you have this conflict shock. And then it turns on the organ program. And so let's say it was an indigestible morsel conflict. I can't digest this. I can't break this down. There's going to be an impact in the brain stem. And then on the organ level, in your um, intestines, there's going to be growth of additional tissue cells. And so that's how it functions. Psyche, the shock, I can't digest this. Brain, for this particular program, the brainstem. And then on the organ level, the organ starts changing. And the organ will change however it needs to change in order for you to resolve the conflict. And so for the example of the indigestible morsel, if I can't digest something, my body says, I can help. I can produce extra cells. And those cells will produce extra digestive juices to help you to break down this thing you can't break down. It's, it's always functional. It's always biological. You know, conventional world comes in and says, oh, no, there's extra cells in your colon. You have colon cancer. This is the big problem. And it is a problem if it grows to the point where it blocks the passageway. You know, and in, in a situation like that, it's very sensible to have a surgery, to remove it so that you can continue to live. 
However, though, we want to get to why did your body build that tumor in the first place? Because if you don't understand that and you don't ever resolve the conflict, the body will continue to adapt as necessary. And so that's the psyche brain organ connection. That is the first biological law. Any questions there? Should we move right into I mean, it's a lot. It's it, it's a lot. And yet it all literally makes sense. It all sort of, it, there's nothing confusing about these laws because they are so natural and just make sense. Um, you know, and I can assure that lots of people are imagining different ways in which this could be playing out or manifesting. And, you know, we so often, I don't know if we so often no, but like, I'm, I'm grateful to be alive in this time when we're more open and willing to talk about trauma and different things like this, because I think we have not fully grasped, not fully understood, or rather the medical field purposely ignores um, trauma and its role because they'd rather you take our drugs, get our surgeries, be our patient for life. Yeah. And I do think that there is suppression of this intentionally because if it would rearrange everything that we know about healthcare, you know, it would, a, a very small percentage of what we do for healthcare right now would remain. Um, like I said, so the example of surgery when necessary, but there'd be a way less surgeries. There wouldn't be preemptive surgeries, wouldn't be taking out, you know, you know, women's reproductive organs because they might may have a G that might do because it's not about the genes, it's about the experience. And so that's the thing is every woman, every woman has the capacity to build ovarian cancer. Every woman has the capacity to build breast cancer. Every, every person has the ability to grow a colon tumor. And this is biologically reasonable. It makes sense because at some point in our evolutionary history, our ancestors needed the ability to build extra breast gland cells, to build extra colon cells, because if we didn't have that ability, we wouldn't have made it. So these micro changes that our body has the capacity to build for us are is literally the reason that we're alive. And so that's why there will never be a cure for cancer, because cancer isn't something that cancer is an adaptative process within the body that's necessary for organisms to survive in varying conditions, because you don't know if you're going to swallow a bone and there's going to be a bone in your gut and you need to digest it. So the body needs to produce extra digestive juices. That is a very functional thing. Um, and so that's, that's why this completely changes the story in every regard. And, you know, the pharmaceutical medical industrial complex isn't prepared for that rearrangement. You know, this information is disruptive to their business model. And so, you know, it makes sense that Dr. Hammer was suppressed and had his license taken away. And, you know, few people know about this work today, which is why I'm so passionate about talking about it, because once you see it, you can't unsee it. Once you know for yourself that, you know, this sneeze, this cough, this shoulder pain, this diarrhea, I know exactly where it came from. I had this experience. My body adapted. I know why this is happening. I know how long it's going to happen. You become your own doctor. You need so far fewer, you know, it's like, it would just change everything. Yeah, I mean, and I've been, um, look, the, once you really dive in and understand more about Pasteur and germ theory, and again, theory, remember people, it's only a theory, and yet it seems to have gripped the entire way that we do things. And, and to your point, epigenetics, you know, we, we have seen that we are literally able to change our genetic expression through controlling stress factors. And so that alone should give people pause to really understand that like there is so much more under your control than not in your control. And what happens though is now you can become an empowered person and and living your life in a way that's just out of out of step with what their plan is for you in terms of, you know, when you're going to need X insurance and you're going to need to take these drugs and you know, I've avoided doctors for many years simply because they're, what are they going to tell me? They're going to tell me, hey, take this drug, do this thing. And and I'm just, I'm not willing to be a party to it, which is, you know, why we do the fermented foods, why we're so passionate about uh, getting our nutrients from, from what we're consuming and from what we're exposing ourselves to or not exposing ourselves to as the case may be. So that's the first law. Second law, 
So the second law is the law of two phases. And so this is how our bodies operate when we are in a conflict. So we have a normal day-night rhythm. And when we have a shock, when that thing catches us off guard, the body shifts into heightened fight or flight. This is the sympathetic system. And so that's when you're in the conflict. This is when either there is cell loss, cell growth, or functional loss. And that, again, it's purposeful for the program that's necessary for whatever it is that you were dealing with. And so the body will, um, when you're in that fight or flight phase, your hands are cold. You are preoccupied, thinking about the conflict constantly. Your appetite is suppressed. Your heart rate is up. And so this is where, you know, your whole nervous system is like, we've got to resolve this. We've got to resolve this. We've got to resolve this. And so every moment that you're in the conflict, the, the program is going through whatever it needs to do, whether it's, again, widening the throat, widening the bronchi, add additional cells to the colon, adding additional cells to the breast line, adding additional cells to the dermis, whatever the program is necessary, that's what's happening during the conflict. Then when you resolve it, when you, when you find that moment of relief of, oh, it wasn't a problem. Oh, I found my, my bag. It wasn't stolen. Oh, uh, I got the information that, you know, my, my loved one is safe and sound. They're not in danger. Everything is okay. When we breathe that sigh of release, the body moves out of that sympathetic phase and it has to move into the parasympathetic. So again, it's, a, it's like a pendulum. So if we swung over to the sympathetic dominance for five hours, the body now has to swing back. We're going to be just feeling a little down, a little, ooh, little tired, a little fatigued, because now the body has to restore that tissue. If we built extra cells during the conflict, those cells need to be decomposed using bacteria. If we lost cells during the conflict, those cells need to be rebuilt. And so it makes perfect sense. It's just, you know, you went through an experience, you had to adapt tissues. Now those tissues no longer need to be adapted. They need to go back to their normal homeostatic resting state. And so that's what's happening, what we call the healing phase or the restoration phase. So when we experience symptoms, this is the biggest re reframe. When you think that you are sick, when you start getting a sore throat, when you start getting stuffy nose, headache, oh, my body is sore, that is when your body is healing. That is when your tissues are in that repair and restoration mode. But that's when most people think, oh, no, I'm sick now. I'm sick right now. You're not sick right now. You were adapting. And that's the thing is you're never sick. You're either adapting or healing. You were adapting when you were in high stress, when you were not sure how the thing was going to work out, when you were worried about that thing. That's when you were adapting. And now your body is restoring or healing. And so there is no sickness. It's, it's either adaptation or healing. That's what my body is always doing. And halfway through the healing phase, you're going to have this big squeeze. And so this is either, you know, a spasm or a sneeze or a coughing fit, or it could be a, a, a seizure that happens during this big squeeze. That's when the body is pushing out all of the fluid from the brain and from the organ. And so and then our body gets back into the normal um, after a scarification phase, the body goes back into our normal day-night rhythm. And so this program, Dr. Hummer discovered that this is how it always works. There's always a conflict phase, a healing phase, a, a big squeeze, an epicrisis, the second phase of healing, and then you go back to normal. And this is actually, he found this mirrored in, in music. That music follows the same pattern. He's got this beautiful lullaby that he wrote for his wife that if you listen to it on repeat, it helps to harmonize your system. It helps you to resolve and stay out of conflict. So there's like, it's so beautiful. It's really, it's mathematical. When you look at nature, nature is mathematical. Biology is mathematical. There's, it's always sensible and always follows a certain pattern. And this is what I love about this new dermal medicine. It's, it, it's just, there's so much logic and sense it feels in flow and, and there's just, there's so little need for grasping, for trying to figure it out, for like, you know, contact tracing and understanding of who you were in touch with. And, um, and then also even eliminates the, the stress or worry that other loved ones are going to endure the same type of, of sickness or pattern. And I love how you talk about, or like how, he talks about as you're experiencing the symptoms, that's when you're healing, not when you're sick, which is the exact opposite, I think, of what most people have thought of all this time. And, 
you know, for me, whenever I have any sort of illness, and honestly, I haven't been sick in three years, you know, uh, October 2019 is the last time I had any sort of healing crisis that that necessitated I go, you know, take time out of my life and and just, you know, focus on allowing my body to repair itself. And and I feel like that so much of this is it, it is there's there is an emotional energy. There's um, there's a heart energy behind it. And whenever my immune system goes through this process, there's an upgrade I'm receiving. There's new information that now my body has. There's um, like the scarification you're talking about. There's now a residue of what I've been through that is um, a platform for creating a, a space and a body that um, is not going to react in the same way. That's not going to respond in the same way because it's been through this experience. Like there's something incredibly valuable about going through these experiences because on the other end of it, at least for myself, I feel like I've, I'm just more complete. I'm more whole and I'm more um, in my body. Yeah, everything is, and that is everything is an opportunity to evolve. And so when you go through something, when you have a conflict, you have a shock when you have something you're like i don't know how to deal with this you do you have to up level your consciousness in order to resolve that conflict and then you have this blueprint for resolution and so you now have this blueprint where you understand that oh i can't be affected in the same way and yeah so this person yeah the whole idea of the immune system it really isn't a biological immune system the body's just supporting us the body is always supporting us. The body is always adapting. Really, it is our ability to be, you know, immune in situations, to not feel that sense of shock. And so if you've been through something, if you've already up-leveled, if you've already had an experience and you're like, oh, I know how to adapt. I know how to handle a situation like that. That's really what is growing is, is our ability to handle situations, which is so cool because every time we have a conflict that's unresolved, there's just an evolution step. There's something about us that needs to grow. So if someone's got a chronic health issue, there is a nugget in there. There's something that you are meant to grow and evolve beyond that you are kind of in a holding pattern. You're in a stuckness pattern with regard to that symptom because you haven't totally extracted the lesson, the learning that you needed in order to grow, to adapt, to evolve beyond it. And so that's why our symptoms really are our greatest guide to our next step of our personal growth and our personal evolution. Um, because I can see, oh, I haven't, you know, evolved beyond this thing yet. I, I'm still having this problem. And so it's a really cool way to figure out what's going on with me, what's going on behind the scenes of my experience. Well, and to understand, have I actually fully dealt with this situation or not? Because if it continues to arise, then that's, again, an opportunity to go back and re-examine what is this thing <clears throat> that's going on. Um, it, it, and it is like this information is so fascinating. I could tell everybody's really thirsty for more. So, I mean, we can't share all the nature of medicine in just this one conversation. So how do people work with you? How do people learn more about this? Um, let's throw some resources at them. Yeah, so I've got a YouTube channel, uh, the link in my bio, I've got a bunch of free videos. That's where I send people first, just because like, just watch the free video so you can start to wrap your head around how this operates. And then you'll start watching your own experience. You'll notice your next sneeze. The next time you were annoyed by something, you caught off guard, you know, um, and you'll see, oh, I just had a conflict and I just resolved that conflict. You'll start to notice things through that lens. The big one for me was acne. I just, I thought that acne, I went through the whole gamut of the things that I thought caused acne um, until I discovered from Dr. Palmer's work that it's feeling attacked or feeling soiled. Now, every time I get an acne bump, I know exactly what caused it. And I have fewer, fewer, fewer because I'm able to see, oh, you know, I, my dog just jumped up and licked my face and I was not prepared for it. And I got a little caught off guard and there's, you know, old programming of, oh, that's gross <laughs> and that feeling. But if in that moment I draw my awareness to it, I can circumvent any adaptation process by with the awareness. And that's the cool thing about this. The more aware you are of when you're conflicted, of how you're experiencing it, of seeing behind the scenes of, oh, I just received that as, you know, if someone doesn't pay attention to you and you feel a, you know, a pang of, oh, self-devaluation. Oh, that means I'm not important. If that goes on unnoticed, your tissues will adapt to it. But if you see, oh, 
that person just, you know, ignored me or didn't respond to something that I said, um, I, I am making that mean that I'm not important. That doesn't mean I'm not important, how that person behaves towards me. But if I'm not aware of it, it goes on, you know, unconsciously, that's where we go through these adaptations. But we, when we bring our conscious awareness to it, um, that's how we can break the spell. First, you have to learn the biological laws. So there's those, the free videos. There's also uh, videos that you can um, enroll in so that you can learn more information. I teach a class every Monday. It's going on about an hour from now uh, where we just go deeper into all of these things. So we can see how do I apply this to my life? How can I make this make more sense to me? When I have a symptom, when my child has a symptom, how do I process it? How do I handle it? Um, and so, and then you'll start to figure out, oh, this is how you just incorporate it into your life. And it becomes the most obvious, wonderful thing ever. And it's so cool to see it happen. When you see these symptoms, follow the pattern. That's the only way you learn. I can't tell it to you. I can tell it to you and you say, oh, that's interesting. Or you say, oh, I'm a little skeptical of that. Be skeptical. Be skeptical of it. That's fine. Because that will allow you to actually experience it for yourself, which is the only thing that makes it real for you is seeing, oh, I had this conflict. I you know, was separated from my loved one they went out of town. I was really missing them. I was really sitting on the couch feeling really lonely. Oh, I started getting a rash on the inside of my elbow because I wanted contact. I wanted to hug them. I wanted to bring them close and I couldn't. But until you have make that connection in your own psyche, in your own biology, it's just an idea. And so that is, um, those videos are a great place to start. I also have a resource list on my uh, blog and my website that you can look up all the books and the training courses and the things that are available. Um, but I really do. I encourage everyone to learn this for yourself because that's the only, you're the only person who can coach yourself through this, who can understand it for you. This is not an outside in. This is not the doctor told me. This is you are the doctor and you are smart enough to learn the basics of this information for yourself um, so that you can manage your, your life, your health, your family in a more empowered and peaceful way. And who does it upon that, especially in an era when uh, we can start to feel really disempowered by everything that's happening in the world. And yet, um, as much as it, as it seems like there's chaos going on, I truly feel like it's, it's the same type of healing process. We have created a lot of trauma on this planet. And we are going through a process where we're able to release a lot of that trauma assuming that we are willing to look within ourselves and deal with our own traumas there. Um, so it's such a lovely opportunity to be alive right now in this moment and really grateful for all the gifts of your knowledge. And is it Dr. Melissa Sell? Is that the best? Uh, is that how people Google search or is there any anything less mysterious? It's, it's about, is that how yeah, they find you? Yeah, go to my uh... Dr. Melissa Sell on Instagram or YouTube or .com for my website. That's where you can find all the information. I do have, someone asked if I can read more about the thyroid. I do have a tutorial all about the thyroid. Um, if you go to my bio and then you click on the um, the link, the first one is you go to the free uh, GNF, GHK. So it's German New Medicine or Germanic Healing Knowledge. Dr. Glover wanted to get away from, you know, the medicine title. Um, and so the, the healing knowledge of the Germanic, um, which is so beautiful. And so there's a video all about the thyroid out there. And yeah, so any of those places, you could find out more information. You could message me. I do sessions with people um, if you want to dive in a little bit more one-on-one -on -one as well. Great. And then in Germanic, because he's German? Not because he's German, because it, this is targeting <laughs> back to the Germanic peoples. So it's not about the country of Germany. It's about Germania and the ancient Germanic. So they're like the natives of that region who... Uh -huh. You know, they they lived in harmony in accordance with nature. They weren't interested in modern life and modernity. And, you know, so the Romans came in and had gold and they're like, here, take our gold and, you know, we'll buy things from you. But they're like, we don't do that. You know, they didn't want cities. They, they lived alongside rivers and they had a very um, natural, harmonious way of life. And that's just, that's how they lived. And they knew these ancient principles. They knew how the body functioned. They knew that, you know, keeping families um, together is a way to stay healthy. You know, that's one of the main things I think in our society today was the fact that is the fact that, you know, families are so divided, even the birth process, taking a baby away from its mother in those first hours of life 
um, sets that child up for separation conflicts, for self-devaluation conflicts, for territorial anger and fear conflicts, because, you know, the mother and the baby are one unit. And, you know, our modern world doesn't treat them like one unit. They think that you can take the baby away for hours and do things to it and, you know, do all sorts of procedures and treatments and wash it. And that that will have no effect on that mother-baby bond, but it does. And that's really where a lot of our health issues begin is that separation at birth and then, you know, birth and beyond. So it's really everything about our modern society is kind of tailor-made to make us really dependent on the system. Uh, really conflicted internally. And the Germanic people, they lived in a harmonious way. And so the Germanic healing knowledge is getting back to this ancient um, principled way of living in harmony with uh, with our biology. Yeah. And as someone's articulating, a lot of cultures, a lot of named tribes uh, or peoples understood this relationship to, um, to Gaia. And I think that, um, or to 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 nature, uh, if you will, and um, I think that this there that that's what's exciting is there's a resurgence of this ancient wisdom coming back to the surface because we really need it right now. We really need to be connected. We really need to be more connected to Gaia. I call myself a goddess for Gaia because I just I love. I love this planet so much. It's so beautiful. And the people here are really amazing too. And um, the more that we can embrace and uplift each other, I think that's just, you know, that that's my goal. That's my vision. And obviously it's something you shared too, Melissa. So thank you so much for taking the time to be here today. Really appreciate all of your wisdom and um, uh, just loved having you today. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I just love any opportunity to share this so that people can, you know, get turned on to this information and um, have the wisdom so they can empower themselves. So yeah, thank you for having me. Absolutely. Well, everybody, thank you so much for being here on another Mama Monday. Um, Melissa is a fabulous guest. I hope that you'll dive in and learn more about um, German New Healing and um, really appreciate having you all here today. We'll see you next time. Don't forget to like, follow, share, comment, especially if you found this content valuable. And that way, even more people can learn about it. So thank you, everybody.